That, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the most dangerous paintings you're ever likely to see. It's John Constable's The Hayway. It's painted in a Suffolk field in 1821. Now, you're probably thinking, it doesn't look all that dangerous. After all, it regularly tops the polls as the nation's favourite painting. It's a, a tourist magnet in the National Gallery in London, and it's reproduced everywhere from biscuit tins to fridge magnets. But that painting should come with a public health warning. And I'm not even joking. In fact, I'm going to take it off the screen for a bit to uh, limit our exposure. Uh, but don't worry, I'll be returning to it in a bit. I'm going to tell you why I think it's so dangerous. But first, let me, let me tell you how I got into 19th century art and literature in the first place. So we're back at school, I'm 15 years old, and we're studying John Keats's Ode to a Nightingale, the romantic poet John Keats, and it blew my mind. Yeah, you know, if you know the poem, all that fading from the world into the forest dim, into the realm of music, into those grand abstracts, art and beauty, kind of thing that a sensitive 15-year-old really responds to. But there was one phrase that pulled me up short, though I didn't quite know why at the time. And that phrase was hungry generations. Somehow, amid all that romantic transcendence, all those visions and waking dreams, it seemed to me that that connection with the world and its troubles was what the poem was really invested in. So it turns out that in the years before Keats wrote Ode uh, to a Nightingale, Britain was suffering a period of <coughs> terrible food insecurity. The entire southeast was badly hit, and towns and villages across the region were torn apart by the so-called bread or blood food riots. And they led to executions and transportations. So yes, Keats's Ode was about beauty and music, but it was also about hunger, though no one ever seemed to be discussing it. Now, we may think that food riots are firmly consigned to the past, but we'd be wrong. That photograph was taken at the beginning of the 2011 London riots, or uprising. And you're looking at one of the first premises to be looted. And forget what you saw on TV, it wasn't a luxury trainer's store or a flat screen TV outlet. No, no, it was a convenience store in Hackney. Yeah. Those are the new hungry generations. So Keats's ode takes me back, or is that forward, to 2011. And shockingly, it also takes me to the present. Food, poverty is on the increase. More people in the UK than ever are relying on food banks. It affects the unemployed, the homeless, the sick, but it also affects teachers, nurses, young children. Latest figures show one in four households struggles to put food on the table. These are the new hungry generations. So what can a literature professor, what can I do to address that challenge? <clears throat> well, I'm fortunate to work in a team with a uh, literary uh, historian, Jane Archer, and a plant scientist, Howard Thomas. And we've been able to combine the insights of literary analysis with those of food science. In the past, I just wanted to know what Keats meant when he said, beauty is truth, truth beauty. But now, I want to know how, as a species, we're going to feed 9 billion people by the year 2050. Okay, so I'm not going to claim I have the answer to that one now, although it's probably going to involve eating a lot of insects. <laughs> but I do know that part of the answer lies in us as, as consumers and uh, as policymakers and recalibrating our sense of the value of a fairer distribution of food. And I think that some of our best loved historical poems and paintings can help us with that. But there's a catch. We've become so disconnected, so alienated from the land that we're unable to see the ways in which our literature uh, uh, engages with and maps onto the material conditions of the age. 
We've forgotten about the processes by which our food is planted, grown, harvested, and uh, produced, and distributed. Actually, it's worse than that. When we look today at historical representations of agriculture in some of our favorite poems and paintings, we tend to see sentimental, reassuring scenes rather than warnings. And those misreadings are actually contributing to our complacency and to some of the poor decisions we're making around food policy. We need to become better readers of the past if we're to make better, more informed, more humane decisions about the future. So there it is again. John Constable's The Haywain is one of the uh, nation's most popular paintings, and it's not hard to see why. It seems to present an image, a quintessential image of the English countryside, a calm, leisurely scene of rural retreat. Right? Well, you'd hardly know it, but just five years before Constable painted the Haywain, the entire southeast was torn apart, villages and, and, and towns in that region torn apart by those uh, very blood, uh, bread or blood food riots. But Constable, well off son, of a Suffolk miller and owner of the local granary, knew it all too well. Now his painting seems to want to smooth over recent events, to reconfirm <coughs> the old social order, the old hierarchies. But as much as the region's recent violence is displaced and pushed to the edges of the field, history finds a way back in. It wants to quibble with Constable's smooth aesthetic and, and with our acceptance of it. According to the National Gallery's key facts about the painting, that hayway and that agricultural wagon in the foreground is standing in the water, serenely static, stationary. And that's how the painting's usually understood, it's how it's interpreted. The scene's so pretty, its central character seems to have stopped work to admire his surroundings. All's well that's well, the painting seems to say. Nothing to see here. Business, as usual. But much as I love the National Gallery, its description of a standing hayway makes no sense at all. Or rather, it only makes sense to someone who isn't attuned to another set of key facts, the material facts of agriculture, farming. The painting's called The Hayway, singular. But there are, in fact, two agricultural wagons in Constable's famous painting. And the second one is the key to unlocking this famous scene's barely contained energies and velocities. Has anyone spotted it yet? There it is. That's the second hayway, and it's tiny, it's easy to miss, but it's there. And it's being loaded up in that meadow in the background. And it tells us something about the actual speed of that wagon in the foreground, which was probably going hell for leather when Constable saw it. What the painting actually depicts is a carefully choreographed process. One wagon's being loaded up, while the other's being unloaded. Unloaded where? Well, some art critics suggest that the hay is being taken to a water mill off to the right of the painting. Anyone see why that makes no sense at all? Ever tried to mill hay? <laughs> Don't work. <laughs> you mill corn, not grass. You can see how out of touch with the land we are. No, the hay's being taken to a barn. And there's one behind us, behind where Constable set up his easel that morning. And that's where the hay, food for livestock, is being taken by the shortest route through the mill stream as quickly as possible. But why all the haste? Because the heavens, those, those menacingly dark clouds blowing in from the left above the field, are about to open. It's going to rain. And if it rains and the crop gets wet, it'll have to stay where it's been cut out on the field, where it risks rotting. Or worse, it'll be taken in wet, where it's more likely to grow contaminants such as mould and ergot. And, and actually that's devastating to health if it enters the food chain. The route of the two hayways, from an aerial perspective, would look something like this. I have to say I'm not quite as proficient at drawing as comfortable. <laughs> um, but you get the idea. 
What Constable Painting is showing us then is, is a process that's been honed for maximum efficiency, <laughs> maximum speed, and maximum, though unequally distributed, profit. And that wagon driver, <laughs> he isn't a figment of the artist's imagination. He's one of Constable's father's hired labourers. And times being what they were, he's probably not getting a fair wage. Just one year after Constable paints the hayway, the entire region erupts again in yet more violence. Perhaps that wagoner, or his friends, will be among the rioters. So, beneath the surface of what might look to us like, and what all those fridge magnets want us to think is, a bucolic idyll, an escapist paradise, is the region's recent history of, of unrest and social division, rising prices, and hungry, rioting inhabitants. And that wagon moving through the water, it exists at the center of a, of, a, of a fraught network of economic and social relations on the point of violent upheaval. And it may not be what Constable wants us to see, but it's what the painting's telling us, if we'll listen. Okay, now I'm a, I'm a literature prof, so let's bring this home with a, a literary example. Keats's Ode to Autumn, it's the most anthologized poem in the English language. Season of mist and mellow fruitfulness, yeah? that one. It was composed in 1819, just two years before Constable painted the hayway. And much like the hayway, it's, it's sold to us today as depicting a scene of idyllic harvest home in the cornfields overlooking Winchester, where the drowsy reapers here in stanza two uh, are sleeping on the furrows, while their hooks spare the next swathe and all its twined flowers. Goes down easy, doesn't it? But in fact, Keats arrived in the area shortly after financial speculators had bought up all the leases and all the cornfields in the area to profit from rising bread prices. The old labouring families were forced off the land, wages predictably went down, and the old custom of gleaning, whereby the workers could take some of the crop home for themselves and keep it, that was outlawed. The reapers, the new workers, the reapers that Keats is depicting in stanza two, they couldn't even afford to buy the bread made from the expensive corn they were harvesting, the hungry generations. And that bit about the reapers taking a well-earned nap, you guessed it, <coughs> it doesn't make sense. Laborers were supposed to work flat out at harvest time. You, you worked as long as it was light to gather the crop in before it rained. Of course, if you were poorly paid, there was little incentive and uh, agricultural journals of the day had to caution landowners to keep a close watch on your harvest men to see they work their hours. Those reapers shouldn't be slacking off. So do we still, so do we still think this is a, a picturesque scene of, of calm and uh, leisurely rural retreat? Or rather, or rather a withdrawal of underpaid, hungry labour? Possibly beginnings of a strike. Keats's much-loved ode, like Constable's pole-topping painting, captures and examines a distinct moment of crisis. Exploited labourers, unscrupulous bankers, an age struggling to recover from violent food riots, and an age unable or simply unwilling to share out resources equitably. Sound familiar? <laughs> so, these famous, apparently reassuring historical works, in fact, have a stark message for us. They tell us that food security and the social bonds it sustains is put at risk when sustenance is seen simply as a commodity from which as much profit as possible is extracted. Put at risk when it seems to make more sense to discard food than to explore ways of sharing it out more equally. Put at risk when history's hungry generations return to shame us all. Thank you. <laughs>